one of the things that your story, your story brings history to life through your connection to the story and through that imagination and the sensory things that you bring to bring this story to life. And one of the things about the story is you also connect it up with with the resources of India and what's happening in India now. Um, because I think on that journey, uh, the chaps, so to speak, mm -hmm. went and saw the resources in India. And India was at a very different place, you know, with industry, for example. So talk to us about those connections that you're making to what's happening in India now. And how does that connect back with Jung's journey there? Yes. And uh, your... Yes. Um, well, uh, when... The chaps went to India. Um, of course, one must bear in mind that it was uh, just about 18 months before the outbreak of World War II, and I didn't really make the connection properly until I, oh, I guess, started really delving into it. But the, the group of scientists, it was planned that they would go to the big Tata industrial site um, just... Uh, west of Calcutta, about 160 miles west of Calcutta, and the LAC Research Institute. Um, many, uh, you know, big iron refineries and so on. And then afterwards they were scheduled to visit oil refineries in Assam, as it was known, and the big forestry uh, research station up in uh, Dehradun. And, and of course, really, they were, they were looking at India's natural resources. And what I've been slowly drawn into is the unbelievable effect of nations and big global corporations wanting to devour, for instance, aluminium from the land of India and the people who are being most affected by this, uh, genocidally affected by it, are of course the Adivasi people, the root people of India. Uh, we would, in this culture, we would call them the indigenous people, the aboriginal peoples. And the land grabs and the switching of laws to accommodate big conglomerations doing what they want, it's, it's really very devastating. But if when I looked carefully at the material that I found, I realized, and I've since substantiated this from other reading, that even at that time, Britain and Germany were vying for the aluminium from the east coast of India. And in fact, from what I've read, uh, Hitler's main metallurgist was actually encouraging the Japanese to invade the east coast of India because everyone wanted the aluminium. You know, it's part of uh, armament, huge armament industry, and also nuclear, you know, machinations uh, use aluminium a lot. This um, land grabbing and um, exploitation of earth, natural earth bounties is, is something for us we all have to think about. Yeah. We, we forget that Jung's journey took place, journey to India and Ceylon, we now call Sri Lanka, was just before the Second World War. And it becomes then very understandable why at the end of the journey, Jung sort of uh, hunkered himself into a very tight container, so to speak, didn't get off the boat in Bombay on his return journey from Colombo, Bombay, then back to Marseille, no, he didn't get off the boat in Bombay because he felt he had to really look at what was going on in Western consciousness and what needed to be dealt with with respect to our relationship to the shadow and the Christian relationship to the shadow. And that was his area of primary concern. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. That is one thing that you also do throughout this work is you weave in uh, and throughout you really uh, weave in Jung's dreams um, as well as the visions and 
you really make some very interesting connections um, from his childhood dreams all the way through his connections with India and how it plays through the dream, his dream life. Yes, actually, I was shocked to realize that Jung's first dream, he actually came very soon to realize had connections with Vishnu, Brahma, Shiva, and I hadn't made the connection. And he's still talking about Vishnu um, a few months before he died. Uh, how astonishing is this? Uh, to me, it's really quite um, wonderful. So really it was a theme throughout his life? Absolutely, a subtext, mm -hmm. uh, an unconscious grounding, if you like, uh, a revelation of his genius, what he needed to bring forward into consciousness in, in his lifetime. And uh, I think we're all much more indebted to him than we realize. You know, we all probably know that uh, many people have used Jung's work and haven't credited him in the way that he should have been credited. I think it was Ronald Lang said, well, we owe, we owe this development of consciousness to Jung, but nobody says it. <laughs> and, uh, you know, all his work on, um, uh, we, we now call it biofeedback. If you look at the North American literature on biofeedback, you don't find a mention of Jung. And so how is he connected originally? Well, he did the uh, galvanic skin response research um, before, bef I was going to say before the beginning of time. No, um, <laughs> at the beginning of the 20th century with his word association test. You know, people are, are I think many people have not wanted to quote Jung because he's hard to read and they don't, they think he's all mixed up with mysticism, whatever that is. But no, we've got to be, you know, pure scientists or whatever, so we don't quote Jung. Well, I think part of that is that he is, in many ways, hard to read. Some people think he's a bad writer. Um, but I think it, he writes in story. And so you can't say, aha, got it. And of course, his words shift, words wiggle, you know, all words wiggle. And their meaning is dependent on the context in which they're used. They, it, they shift slightly. Mm -hmm. But if you want a tight definition, then you're a bit up the creek mm -hmm. with storytelling. Because <laughs> mm -hmm. it, it just keeps unfolding. Exactly. And you have to get in relationship with it. Yes. And yeah. the man was voluminous. Yes. <laughs> so you, you never finish learning about him. Yes. <laughs> Yeah, it, just like your work, you know, it's it's um, very rich with many layers. And, you know, we've talked about people, how the best way to approach your work as well, which is to sit and listen and relax and listen to it more mm -hmm. than once mm -hmm. and engage and watch their dreams and, mm -hmm. and write them down. Especially watch your own dreams. Mm -hmm. And that's become very clear to me as I get older. Um, I'm very thankful I've written my dreams down because now I can see patterns and things as I approach older age. So I'm always saying to young people who work with me, now you must write your dreams down because, believe me, you won't remember them. Mm -hmm. if, you, if you don't write them down, you think, oh, I'll never forget that. We do. Yes. 